upset by seeing that, some of us take offense. Most of us say that's not true, that's not me. The Christian in that video is in all of us. Whether you like it or not, that is true. We buy the nicest, fanciest phone. We buy the nice, fanciest tablet. We buy whatever it is, and what we do to justify it, we put the Bible on it. Oh, it's holy now. It's holy. All of a sudden, that, that's all makes it better by putting that on. But I think if we actually sat down and looked at how much we actually use that Bible on that phone that we justify it for, it might get used 1% of the time. 30% of the time, we, play, we surf the Internet on it. 20% of the time, we play games on it. And the other 50% of the time, we use it to connect us to the world with, uh, with pointless information about our feelings, about what's going on, what, what, what's on in the world with Facebook and stuff like that, and what our problems are. We want to vent out our problems, but we don't want any advice back from that. And then we, instead of actually using the phone, what it's for, to actually call somebody to talk about our problems, to make it out, so that time we, it's about 50% of the time. Or what about our bookshelves? They're lined with all these fancy Bibles that we had to just have. Because if we buy them, we're going to read them, right? No, they're going to sit there and collect us until the next book comes out, until our magazine pile builds up, until our newspaper pile builds up. And we want to read that because, oh, we got to catch on that. So then the Bibles go on the shelf. And then all of a sudden, they never get read. They collect dust. Just because you buy something doesn't mean it actually, uh, actually gets used. <clears throat> the snotty, uppity, well-dressed Christian in that video is me, is you. We all come about that sometime in our life where we think we might be better than the world till we start actually talking to the world and find out they're actually doing good too. Now, I work at Walmart, the distribution center. Now, they were started by Sam Walton, a devout Christian. Now, Walmart to this day still, I wouldn't say is a Christian company, but they still go out in the community. They still, we do, we go rake lawns for old people. We still do... Um, the meals at the Beaver Dam, uh, Jefferson School, they come out and they'll make the meal and they'll serve the community meal and stuff like that, yet they're not a Christian organization. So the non-Christian organizations are out there still doing good, good stuff too. Started by Christian organizations in the past. So, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me. Uh, we have no problem with paying our phone bill, our car bill, our house payment, our heating bill, our electric bill, our internet service bill, our insurance bill, our credit card bills, our cable or satellite bill, because that is all, all the right thing to do, because that's the Christian way that we have to. We have to pay our bills because we don't want it to look bad. But the minute that Sunday morning comes, we want to write out a check. Oh, I, I had this bill come up this week. I can't do that. I'll, do the, I'll just cut back on giving for that. And so then all of a sudden, instead of actually looking for a cheaper cell phone bill, to not have all that data, all that extra stuff, or not have all them extra movies on satellite or cable, we don't look at cutting back on that. The first thing to go is, is cutting to the church. Now, I'm not up here preaching because of, the, because of all the stuff going on. No, Jim never told me anything. God laid this on my heart years ago. It's the one topic that nobody wants to talk about. And I am blessed somehow, some way, to have the gift of giving. I don't believe I do, but everybody says I do. It's just a natural thing. So it's not a natural thing that people actually do. I struggle with this. And so we try to, we go and we say, okay, he said 10%. We think that up. You can't put numbers on that. We use 2 Corinthians 9-7. Go ahead, Joy. It's up on the screen. Each of you we use this to back up our thing by not saying we, we're not going to go out of percent. We're just going to, you should give. And what we do is we skip that middle part, what you have decided in your heart. We, so we put that verse as, each of you should give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So we take that verse and we justify our giving or not giving because we aren't cheerful about giving a certain percent of our income. We don't want to give under compulsion, so we make excuses. We'll come back to this later and put it in actually in its context instead of taking it out. So we're going to go, if you have your Bible, you can open to 2 Corinthians. We're going to go 2 Corinthians 11 <coughs> and 7, 7 to 9. And we're going to see what actually Paul says about not giving to your local church. So we're going to look at it the other way. Paul has a lot to say about giving. So chapter 11, verse 7, was it sin? For me to lower myself in order to elevate you by preaching the gospel of God to you free of charge. 
I robbed other churches by receiving support from them so as to serve you. And when I was with you and needed something, I was not a burden to anyone. For the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied what I needed. I have kept myself from being a burden to you in any way and will continue to do so. Now, if we look at that, what the first thing he's, he's asking himself, was it sin? Now, did anybody think that a missionary taking money is actually sin? None of us would think that. But Paul being a missionary, that's the first thing he questioned himself. He felt guilty taking money from another church. Why did he feel guilty? Because I robbed other churches. So those people that actually support missionaries actually have a home church. They go to a home church. They have needs at that church. They have ministries at that church. They have things going on in that church that need that money. And yet you're, it's donated to a missionary. Now, if God laid that on your heart, that is awesome. That is how missionaries survive. There is nothing wrong with supporting missionaries. That is a good thing. I think we all should do that. But look at the missionary side point of it. He's actually thinking, is that sin for him taking that money? That's a big X upon himself thinking about that, you know. And so as, as Paul goes about his ministry, He's bivocational. We learn about Paul that he's a tent maker in some communities where he goes to plant a church. And then in other communities, like in Corinth, the Macedonians, who we're going to find out were very poor to begin with, were sending him money to supply his needs. He has kept himself from being a burden to the Corinthians, so they didn't have to give any of their money, pour any of their stuff into him in order to support him, so that stuff could have gone for ministry in that community. Now, there's a little difference between bivocational full-time. Some people say the pastor shouldn't, be, shouldn't get paid. I, I believe there's clear evidence in the Bible that that's not true, but I believe there's clear evidence it can be the other way also. Am I giving you an answer? No, I'm not. If you're bivocational, let's look at the po positives. I work full-time at the Walmart Distribution Center, yet I put in my time at the ministry. Mike works full-time delivering. He also works full-time doing youth. Sean works full-time, yet he does full-time ministry. Jim works full-time for the church. He gets paid. Now, let's think of this as bivocational. What is the greatest thing me, Sean, and Mike can do in the community? Who do we see every day? We see non-believers. We are blessed, if you're going to call it that, to see non-believers every... Oh, there's Joe. Sorry, Joe. Didn't know. Joe works full-time, too. Didn't see Joe back there. <laughs> okay, so we're disowning him today. Okay. All right. So the greatest thing that we have is just like you, if you work a full-time job, is you get to see a non-believer every single day. You pour your life into that, those people every single day that you see them. Jim works full-time as the ministry. He, don't, he has to look for ways to go out to see non-believers. He is blessed with our phone calls all the time. He gets to hear our problems. He gets to be on call whenever we want. If you're willing to buy him food, he'll meet you wherever you want in the amount of time it takes him to go from point A to point B to get to see you. So he gets to see us all the time, yet he doesn't see non-believers. Now, if Jim was working full-time, I remember when Jim worked full-time, paper route, teaching, if you want to get a hold of him, or if you want to get a hold of me, Sean, Mike, Joe, there's a good chance you're not going to get a hold of us during the day because we're working. So if the church, the body, needs us, we're, I don't answer, look at my phone until after 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And, you know, so you're not be able to reach out to us. So that what, good or bad... They can work hand-in-hand hand, both things. But if we take, if we take a full-time staff out, and I'm going to put Eileen on the spot. Eileen works full-time now. She, I'm sorry, I didn't include you too. She would be bivocational too. I remember when Eileen wasn't going to school and Eileen wasn't working. It's a big difference. No, I'm, I'm comparing. I'm showing. I'm just using in my sermon to show is, is the difference. Okay, I remember when Eileen didn't work full time. If we wanted something. No, she was full time ministry. 
so Eileen, it, when, when we wanted to get a hold of Eileen, Eileen, Eileen was like my wife. She dotted her T's, crossed the eyes of Jim. You know, we make fun of Jim now because of, of uh, you know, forgetting things and stuff like that. Well, Eileen's Jim's backbone. We might see it more now that he might be forgetting things and stuff like that. Well, it's because Eileen's working full-time now. And I'm not saying good or bad, because we all work full-time, as Terry says. We all, my wife stays home with our kids. That's a full-time job. You know, there's always things to do. I'm just showing you the different things right now with what Paul was going through. It's not good or bad. I'm not saying yay or nay or backing it up for Jim in order to get paid and stuff like that. You know, I'm just showing you the different things and what the Bible teaches. Because Paul was that way. Paul was the missionary. All right, now, Paul was Saul from Tarsus. If we go back, Paul was Saul from Tarsus. Before he became a Christian, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees <clears throat> for the Jews. He grew up studying the Old Testament, knew about all the Jewish law and what was required. He started under the great Jewish Pharisees and then became one himself. He knew what was required of God's people, and he made sure to enforce it. He was so passionate about the Jewish community that he went through great lengths to persecute the new way, which we know now as Christians, but it was called the way. So the Old Testament is clear on what giving was in the Old Testament, and Paul was strict to that. You know, he followed that with all his heart. So now the God of the Old Testament is the same God as the New Testament. Now after Saul became Paul, he had his Jesus moment, and God changed his name to Paul, he still went to the synagogues. You know, we forget that. We kind of separate it. Well, Paul still went to the synagogues. Well, Paul still went to the synagogues. He still donated his tithe. He still donated his, his time, he, his advice, and stuff like that. It wasn't until the Jews finally started persecuting the Christians and started kicking them out of the synagogues and the local church was formed. Now, what do you think those Jews did? If we go back even earlier, before Paul became a believer, you have Peter. Peter preaches at Pentecost. Who is he preaching to? He's preaching to the Jews. What happens when those Jews become believers and go back to their hometown? They're still going to the synagogues. They're th the early Jews thought of Christianity as just part of the Jews. They wanted all their Jews to become Christians because Jesus was the Messiah. So what they were doing is they were donating to the local synagogue. Why were they donating to the local synagogues? Because we all have bills. You know, we are blessed. They didn't have lights back then. They had candles and oil. And so we were, you know, we have bills to pay. We have a building to pay for. We have, we, we need food. You know, we like to eat at the Johnson Creek here. So there's food. The synagogues are no different back then. So they, 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 they kept donating. Nobody ever stopped donating. So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And we're going to, Paul's going to remind us about giving. I know a lot of you don't like people talking about giving. Just bear with me. I'm in the same boat as you. So we're just learning together. So 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1. Now about the collection for the Lord's people. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. So now Paul isn't just telling the Corinthians this. He told the Galatian church. He, he's telling everybody that he runs into about it. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money, keeping with your income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Now, why does Paul say keeping with your income, setting it aside, you know, and then planning it out? You know, let's look at it another way. We're going to play devil advocate. We all know of TV preachers that get out on TV, and we know stories of somebody who gave all their stuff away. You know, all of a sudden the preacher says, you know, this ministry can't survive without you. They need you. Please donate all your money right now because God's going to overcome and bless you abundantly with your money. So somebody all of a sudden donates all their money. Is that biblical? No. Now, if God is calling you to do that, that might be a whole other story. But for the majority of the people, no. God knows you have to live on something. God knows we have bills. God knows we have everything else in our life that, that money is what makes things go. It has nothing to do with giving it all. You know, if that's what he wants you to give, great. But, you know, the majority of us, no. 
So let's look at it the other way. Let's put some numbers to it. My, my, my life's an open book. So the only way I got numbers was taking numbers off, off of what my life is. So your income is 40 grand a year. With milking cows and the distribution center, that's about what it is. We're in one income family. Jody doesn't work. When we move to Columbus, we made that commitment right now. We'll see what it is. 40 grand a year, $3,300 a month. My employer, like most of our employers, is blessed to pay half our taxes. If they take taxes out, they're paying half your taxes. So that's 15%. So you're paying 15% of your taxes to the government. So right out there, 15%. My house payment. I was blessed in Juneau, oh, my house was going to be paid for in 10 years, less than 10 years. I would have been blessed. We went to Columbus, now all of a sudden it's 30 years again. Well, my house payment is $665 a month. With, well, that's with uh, property taxes. That's 20% of my income right there. I bought a car. Just bought a car, was blessed to not have any car payment at all. That's kind of nice. Bought a car now because my truck got 16 miles to the gallon and my new car can get 30 some miles to the gallon with driving. So I bought a car. That's $215 a month. That's 6.5% of my income. My cell phone, just phone. I'm not a media person. Anybody who knows me, my wife, my wife has our Kindle lock to get on the internet so I don't mess something up. If I ask her to get on something, she's over here going like this. Okay. It's like, okay, come on. I thought this was a Christmas present for all of us. I'm not a computer person. So if you're blessed to have a great phone, that's awesome. But I have a flip phone. You know, let's go back 10 years. My bill is 90 bucks a month for two, two phones, 2.7% of my income. I looked last month, and I'm sad to say it, we went out to eat nine times, $231 a month. That was 7% of my income. Now, say this person drops a 20 in the offering plate every other Sunday. That's 40 bucks a month. That comes out to just 1% of your, my, my income. Now, say two people work in the family, That'd only be half percent, and we can figure out stuff that way. If I drop 40 bucks a month every week, that comes out to 2% of my income. <clears throat> now, 10%, if we go back to Leviticus, Jim preached about giving on time. I'm not going to go over all the stuff, but if we go back to his sermon and what it was to give to the Levites, it's 10%. You know, that's the sad thing that people can't come across to. 10% is, and why is that? It's just a baseline. You know, people think, okay, hey, you know, if we tell people 10%, well, people aren't going to give more than 10%. Well, Jesus always calls us above and beyond, greater than what the Pharisees are. So the person that gives more than 10%, they don't care about listening to this sermon that I'm saying right now. It's the people that are less than 10% that want to justify stuff. Now, everybody calls us to different things. So we're not going to make excuses. We're not going to say anything. I'm just telling you what God is teaching me through the Bible. So let's go back. I, I encourage every single one of you, if you're a numbers person or not, go through your budget. Just for the convenience of looking at, see what you're spending your money on. Everything from your house payment down to your cup of coffee that you buy every day and see what percent of your income is. None of that necessarily is wrong, but is that stuff more important than giving God his money? Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. So we're going to go back to... That verse, but we're going to bring you up to speed from chapter 8. So let's go to chapter 8, 2 Corinthians, chapter 1. Now Paul is starting out by bragging up what the Macedonians are doing. Now the Macedonians, Macedonians are a poor, would be like a poor, they're a poor town. So if we think of like a poor nation, China, Haiti, Korea, um, Africa, you know, he's talking about a community, a church from that area that is providing his needs. So what he's doing is he's comparing that to Corinth, which is a rich community. He's comparing that to, say, the U.S. Every church in America, whether we like it or not, is rich. You know, there's no doubting that. We are a rich, blessed nation with rich, blessed people. Do I believe them blessings are from God? Yeah, I do. And so... It's easy to say that we are. And so we look at chapter 8, verse 1. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, which would be their tithe, because that is just the basic, you know, and even beyond their ability. 
entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people, and they exceeded our expectation. Now imagine Paul coming to coming there to build up the church and encourage them in Macedonia. He would know how poor they are, and expecting to re, he expected to get something. You know, it's one of them things he didn't expect it, but he probably figured they would. And so, you know, you figure they're poor. Okay, it's going to be a lower amount, and all of a sudden. It'd be like somebody now handing you a check for an unbelievable, no, whoa, no, no, I can't take it. Paul wouldn't want to take it. He flat out says here, no, you know, I can see Paul saying, no, I can't accept this amount. You need it for yourself. I see you living in cardboard boxes. I see you, I see you living in these made-up mud huts. You know, take that money, put it towards you. What did they do? Verse 4, they urgently pleaded with him for the privilege of sharing this service to the Lord's people. The Macedonians got that Paul needed it for his service. They were willing to work hand and foot, live however they want to live, because it was God's money. And so what does it say in, verse, in chapter 5? And they exceeded our expectation. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us also. So they gave themselves first to God. They said, okay, God, Paul's coming. He, he needs stuff for the Jews down in Jerusalem because they're going through a tough time. What can we give God? It was, it was all about God. It's not about them. It's not about Paul. It's not about the Jews in Jerusalem. It's about God. What can we give to God? So, <clears throat> um, so he, we urged Titus, just he had, uh, uh, okay, uh, so verse 6, so he, we urge Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring all to the completion this act of grace on your part. Now Paul is sending Titus to be able to, uh, to the Corinthians, to be able to encourage them, to help them excel in the grace of giving. But now look, listen to this, verse 7, now he's going to build up the Corinthians. Since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. Now, all of us know about the different spiritual gifts. All, a lot of us has taken spiritual gift assessments and surveys. We want to know what God has given us in, and what can we improve, where can we go. You know, faith, oh yeah, I want more faith. Love, oh, I want more love. I want more perseverance. I want more patience. You know, when we pray, I, it, we, we can name out all these different things. How many of us pray for giving? The grace of generosity, the giving. Uh, we, put, we take that and we put that in a separate category. You know, and so none of us pray for that. Is that just as important? Yes, it is. You know, how, what's the greatest God that most of us make here in America? It's money. The greatest God, we don't have idol shrines that we put up. We have our dollar bills. We have our $100 bills. We have everything. What's about me? What can I buy? That's the greatest God that Americans have to struggle with. I think all of us Americans should maybe be praying for the gift of generosity. You know, and so now he goes to um, verse 8. I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, that you through his poverty might become rich. Now Paul wasn't saying and boasting and saying, hey, look at the Macedonians, look at what they're doing. You know, every time we see another church doing something, you know, somebody might be telling us something neat that's going on about there, we get a little jealous. We get a little offended. We think, oh, you know, they're doing that. How come we're not doing that? Paul's boasting about them to show them the grace that God has given them and the amazing thing that God's working through them. If we hear things that other churches are doing, why can't we embrace that, encourage them along, be, be uh, excited about what they're doing? We're not in competition. We're all on the same team. So that's what Paul's doing with Macedonians. And then he comes down and he breaks them up again in the Corinthians in, in verse 10. And here's my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were the first not only to give, but also to have desire to do so. When we start reading this, we think, okay, the Macedonians are the chosen ones. You know, he's breaking up the Macedonians. But all of a sudden it says, 
The Corinthians, last time he needed something, they were the first ones not to just say that they were going to give something, they gave something. You know, so he's not singling out the Corinthians. So now he's asking them, verse 11, now finish the work that you eager willingness to do, that your eager willingness to do may be matched by your completion of it, according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not to what one does not have. You know, God's not asking you to write out this fat check to give everything away. He's asking compared to what you have to give that. He's not not what you don't have. He's not asking like the preacher on TV that's telling you you got to give everything and nothing's going to survive. God's in charge of all the money. If he wants a ministry to survive or die, it's up to the, God, the people that God puts in place. If they're doing his will, and then it's up to God if they're doing his will. It's not about, it's not about you know, that he, they need you. Everybody needs to be part of it, but everybody, he doesn't need it all. Our desire, to, verse 13, is not that others might be relieved while you are hard-pressed but that there might be equality. You know, so we get so caught up in thinking that, okay, you know, every day churches just want all my money. No, it's based off of what everybody has. Look here, at the present time, your plenty, he's talking about the Corinthians, will supply what they need, so somebody else, so that in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. It's a church working together. It's churches working together. The goal is equality, as it is written. The one who has gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. You know, I put money into the basket. You guys put money in the basket. It goes to one big fund, and it supplies what's going on here at the crossroads. It's, it's not your money's more important than mine. My money's more important than yours. You know, if, if I have a lower-paying job, well, I give what I can with my income. You might be blessed with a great job and make a lot of money. Compared to your income, yours might be higher than mine. Does that mean your money's worth more than mine? No. My little bit, your a lot. My lot, your little bit. It all goes together in the same pot. Nobody is greater. Nobody is worse. So now let's go down to chapter 9. So there's no need for me to write to you about this service to the Lord's people. For I know your eagerness to help. You know, Corinthians already have shown they're eager to help. They're willing to step up to the plate. And now Paul has been boasting. I have been boasting about it to the Macedonians. So Paul's boasting about the Macedonians to the Corinthians. Now he's telling the Corinthians that he's boasting about the Corinthians to the Macedonians. So he's not showing any partial. He's not giving any preference to anybody. He's telling them that since last year in Achaia, we're ready to give. And your enthusiasm has stirred most of them to action. But I am sending the brothers in order that your boasting about you in this matter should not prove hollow. So now Paul is just reminding them. He's sending them. He's reminding them, this is what you guys promised. You promised to give. You know, but you that... But, you, but that you may be ready, as I said you would be. For if any Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to say anything about you, would be ashamed of having been so confident. So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to visit you in advance and finish the arrangement for the generous gift you had promised. Then it will be ready as a generous gift, not one grudgingly giving. Now the Corinthians promised to give something. They promised to give Paul a generous gift when he came. Paul is just reminding them. This isn't Paul, you know, out on a preaching rant to saying, hey, I need your money, this and that. The Corinthians already said they were going to give something. He's just reminding them. Why? Because when he gets there, he doesn't want the Macedonians, if the Corinthians forgot, all of a sudden now Paul feels like an idiot because he said he's bragging up the Macedonians saying, hey, they're planning on giving. You guys are struggling. They're planning on giving. You know, and then he gets there and all of a sudden, oh, I forgot. How many of us come to church on Sunday morning and the collection, oh, um, uh, and then you quick throw something in, we write it out. I'm guilty of it. I'm not singling anybody out. I'm just as guilty as that. So that's why Paul says to plan out what you're giving. Plan it out. 
we go just like the video, you know, yeah, yeah, we're, you know, we start, uh, our God's bigger than anybody's God, so we'll start bragging him up to other people, you know, my Jesus, and this and that, they start asking her questions, and oh yeah, yeah we, I give, I give, yep, we give, but then all of a sudden, Sunday morning comes, and you forgot to check, to write the check out, or you forgot to give, or, or, you know, some bill came up, and all of a sudden it's, oh, I can't make this payment. But I promise I will pay it back. Now, we all go through tr struggles. Things like that happen. But the issue is, is when you say, oh, I'll give it next time. Does next time ever come? That's the question. I know in my younger days, I installed a, a routine. If I forgot my check Sunday morning, I owed the church interest. That's just the way I did it because I thought, you know, I can't, the church has bills to pay. You know, what if my, my what if Walmart decided not to pay me? Uh, I forgot to give you your check, Jeremy. Well, my utility company isn't going to be okay with that. My credit card bill is not going to be okay with that. My house payment's not going to be okay with that. <laughs> the church is just like you and me with paying the bills. Are they not? Their bills come in. So I started by... Right, and then, okay, I forgot God, I'm sorry, let me add a little bit more next week and I write the check out. Well, I've gotten pretty good at being consistent now with writing my, my check. Another story, I had a farmer that I used to test milk. He put money in a jar in the milk house and saying every time he swore he had to put money in. Jeremy, it's not going good. Then your punishment isn't enough. I said, put a rubber band on your arm. Every time you say a word, start snapping it. Oh, I couldn't do that. You really don't want to stop swearing then. If you're not willing to make the sacrifice to get over that, do you really want that? So it's just different little things. Ten years ago, Jody and I were part of a church. We called a new pastor. The church board asked everyone to fill out a sheet on what they were planning to give financially. The church wanted to be smart with the money that they were spending. So, okay, everybody that's in the church, write out about what you're planning on giving weekly, monthly, so we can figure out, okay, these are our bills, this is what we can pay the pastor, and stuff like that. Six months into it, me and Jody started having differences with the pastor and stuff like that. I filled out the sheet, and I said, okay, we're not going to cause division, we're just going to leave the church. We're going to leave quietly, we're going to move on. And I told the board and the pastor, I said, we will continue our cont contribution because that's what we planned, that's what we said we were going to do. The pastor told me, we don't need your money. I told the pastor different that I'm still going to send it in. I wrote my check out every week, sent it in. Did they cash it? Yes, they did. Yes, they did. You know, so it's one of them things. What are you promising to God, and then are you following through? So let's go back to Corinthians, chat, uh, verse 6. Remember this. Whoever spare, sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Let's look at that again. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. There it is again. It's planned. You decide ahead of time. You know, a lot of people think that, okay, when I get to church, Jesus is going to give me the Jesus moment to write out that check. Well, what if you're talking to somebody? What if all of a sudden you get distracted? What if all of a sudden this happens and that happens? God, pe people make God out to be more difficult than he is. You know, I plan my bills out, and so why shouldn't the giving be the same way? So then I'm not caught off guard. Then I'm not feeling like, oh, the church want, needs my, I have to give because, you know, I just, I just have to, and you feel guilty. And, and, so, so that's, that, that, and then you can be a cheerful giver. You know, nobody thinks about when their bank comes in their, their checking account and they take out their mortgage payment. Nobody thinks about that. Okay, that's just what has to happen. You know, and then when your house is paid for, are you cheerful? Yeah. You know, all of a sudden you have this bill paid for. So why do we look at giving differently? Why do we look at it and say, you know, that's separate to all our other stuff? We don't want to think of it as a bill because we want to be cheerful, but see all the amazing things the Crossroads is doing. That's what it's doing. So, or the other excuse, um, okay, I, well, one of the excuses, you know, I say, well, all the money's God's money. You know, I just don't take 10%. All of it's his money. That's true. That's good. We need to start thinking that. You know, every single dollar you spend, what are you using it for God's glory? 
But most of the time that people I hear that from, it's an excuse. You know, just because you say all the money is God's money, well, now I'm not going to give it to the church. You know, I want everybody to know, I don't know what any of you give. So don't think that I'm talking to you. I make it a purpose to not look at anybody's check when I take offerings in Columbus because I don't want to know what people give. You know, maybe everybody's giving 20% of their income, but I don't know why God would lay it on my heart to say something. So don't think that, you know, I'm picking out you or whatnot because I have no idea what anybody gives. So that's why I'm preaching on this. So if, um, so the funny, uh, let's see, or the other excuse I hear is the reason, reason people aren't giving because it's a heart issue. That's just bull. I'm sorry to say that. If, it's, if that's just an excuse, that's a feelings issue then. Well, I don't feel like giving. It's not a heart issue. Um, let's, let's get the, the heart figured out then and quit making excuses. What? I don't stop loving my wife because of my feelings or my kids. If I don't want to go to work today, do I think, oh, I don't want to go to work? Screw them. They don't need, they don't need, to, they don't need to get fed tomorrow. No. I go to work whether I like it or not because I love my kids in my family. I want to be able to help support the church. If I didn't make any money, then I can't donate the money God has blessed me with. You know, it's not a feelings. Jesus didn't come and forgive you for your sins almost 2,000 years ago because he felt like it. What was what Jesus said in the, in the garden? If you can take this cup from me, please take it. God, Jesus didn't want to go to the cross. It's not a feelings thing. He did it because he loves you. 2,000 years ago, he knew that you were going to be around, and he did it because he loves you. It's not a feelings thing. So let's take the church away for a minute. Say all of a sudden nobody donated any money. If you're over in Columbus, you got blessed to hear my sermon last week on, on let's, let's look at the world through the Christian's point of view and uh, basically what's in the world. I want anybody to start yelling out things in this world that we know that does good. The Red Cross. What else? Samaritan's Purse. What else? United Way. Salvation Army. Boys and Girls Club. What about hospitals? Do hospitals do good? How many of you remember, I know came from the Beaver Dam area, but I'm sure down here there's two hospitals. What were the names of the hospitals, Jack? Two Christian hospitals. If we look at the world today, everything was started because of Christian beliefs. All the good that goes on. How about public school? We look at that and it's separation of church and state. Public school was started so kids could be able to read and write the Bible. That was the first public school. Everything that we think is good is started because of Christian. What if we pull all that stuff away? We can see stuff over the Middle East. We can cringe, all that stuff. You take the Christian away. Let's look at this church here. We have men's breakfast. Now, what if Vernon had to do that by himself? We have one-way club. What if Joe had to do that himself? What if we had youth ministry? What if Mike had to do that himself? We have three worship services with a praise band, people running the sound system. We have communion affiliated with that. We have um, all different things. What if they had to do it themselves? We have the pantry serving almost 500 people up in Columbus. There's no possible way. I would have given up a long time ago. Well, uh, we have a church plant in Columbus. We have Phoebe's Calling. What if that had to be done by itself? We had our morning snacks back there. What if that had to be done by the person's self? It can't happen. We need one another as Christians. We are one body. A little church of 120 people is doing all that. There's more. The daycare, we forget about the daycare. We're blessed to be in this building all the time. But the daycare is here five days a week. We're blessed to be able to do good things and then to help others, to light shine. There's no possible way that we can do it without one another. Giving is no, no different. You know, we all come together, and it's all part of the same thing. And we need, the thing that's common with all that stuff is believers are part of it. We're all working together. You know, if we take money out of it, 
money is just a fact of life, whether we like talking about it or not. It's just part of life. So verse 8, let's see what happens then. If everybody works together, if everybody takes what their God-given ability is, what happens? Verse 8, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. The righteous endure forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for the food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, let's see, look, look what happens, but it also is in overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. It's all about God. When we hear money, we think, oh, the church needs money, and, you know, somebody's looking for money, somebody needs to get paid and whatnot. And it's about God. God has blessed us with money and in turn to go and give that back. For the obedience, because of this service by which you have proved yourself, others will praise God. So people in the community see the crossroads in Johnson Creek and in Columbus. What happens? We have a nursery that was, that, uh, no, uh, ch a child care that was in need in the community 10 years ago and is here now. There's a pantry up in Columbus serving the needs of people. You know, Joe and a great group of people go over to the school and do one-way club after school. How many parents are thankful that their kids have a place to go? They don't have to worry about them over there. You know, when people say Christians are in charge of something, how many non-believers are easily ready to throw their kids at that? Why? Because they know there is good in that. You know, others will praise God because of that. You are the light, you know, for the obedience. Others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ. Why do we do them things? Because of Christ. That's the thing. That's why we do everything we do. And with for, oh, and for your generosity and sharing with them everyone else. Okay, just look at the, we'll take the two big things. You know, I'd say the five days a week here with the, the daycare. Are those parents blessed being able to drop their kids off? You know, is, is Mike's youth group a blessing for the parents who struggle with teens, who parents and teens, all of us remember their teenage years, you know, did we get along with our parents? Probably not. They can send them the mic to deal with. Do you think they're blessed with that? I think so. Mics can take care of them. You know, so it's a blessing to everyone else. Do you think Mike gives up and Joe gives up his nights for convenience to them? Is it about their feelings? Is it about what they want to do? No. It's about the kids, then in turn, blessing the parents. So hopefully they will understand, they will know who Christ is. And in their prayers, now people can say they're a non-believer. When push comes to shove, do you think they crawl, cry out to God in some way, shape, or form? They do. They do. Excuse my language, but if somebody at work says, God damn it, what do you think they're saying? They're using it as a form of vulgar. You know what I tell them? You sure you want God to do that? That sure makes them think. You know, all of a sudden, it's like, oh, yeah, I really don't want God to do that. You know, I'm having issues already with this. You know, in turn, when they have issues, they're going to cry out to God, one way, shape, or form, if they can't pay bills. God, if you're real, I need your help. And so what is the crossroads? We are there for when they need that, to be able to open up our doors. You know, whether we work full-time for the church, whether we work full-time for another, bit, uh, another company, whether we work full-time staying home, taking care of kids, running our household, we all have something to do. And the question is, what are we doing with that time? What are we doing with that money that it is that God has blessed us with in order to then bless others so then they can bless God. I guess that's the biggest question. This isn't about just about giving. It's about everything in your life. Giving just happens to be part of it. And I'm the one, some reason, God asked me to come preach about it. 
And so, you know, it's, it's tough. We don't want to hear, somebody wants more of my money. Nobody wants any of your money. It's God's money. And so God's just asking for a percent of your income to be able to pay for the things that we have no way to, to break. Just ask Jim. Jim wants a piece of Jim Jim thought the church wanted a piece of land. He what's the first thing he went to to the village and asked them? Will you just give it to us? <laughs> no, they ain't going to do that. That's just the way it is. You know, I can go to businesses with the pantry and ask them to give us some stuff, and some people are willing to give us this give us the stuff. Most of the time because it's they're not making money off of it, it's expired. They feel some good of being able to donate it. We get that stuff. We hand that out. The people that receive that, in turn, bless God. I thank God. It's all about him. It's not about you and me. It's about him. 